lecture. Um, maybe I'll do just a tiny poll, poll and say, let's see, I know we have social work faculty members here and part-time lecturers and folks, anyone who teaches at social work. Give me a wave. <clears throat> I know we have some students here. Can you give me a wave also? I'm impressed, it's five o'clock p.m. Did Leah require this in one of her classes? Um, <clears throat> Um, and I think we have a number of alumni, alumnae, who are here. Can you give us a wave too? Great, look how, look how energetic they are at the, at the alumni level, I love it. <coughs> Still happy after all these years, I like that, that's good. Um, welcome to the Numon Lecture for this year. I'm gonna start out by telling you a little bit about um, <coughs> Dr. Potenza, who's our speaker today. He's actually brought his entourage with him too. You can, they're seated up front, you can talk to them later. So. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Potenza is a board certified psychiatrist with subspecialty training and certification in addiction psychiatry. He trained at uh, Yale University and those of you who, students who are in the group listened carefully to this combination of things. He received a combined bachelor's of science and master's of science with honors in molecular biochemistry and biophysics, and then a PhD in cell biology, the latter degree he did concurrently while he was doing his MD um, through the medical science training program. He completed internship psychiatry residency and addiction psychiatry fellowship training also at Yale. Currently, he is a professor of psychiatry, child study, and neurobiology at the Yale University School of Medicine, where he's the director of the Problem Gambling Clinic, the Center of Excellence in Gambling Research, and the Women and Addictive Disorders Core of the Women's Health Research at Yale. <clears throat> so a number of hats. Dr. Potenza is on the editorial board of 10 journals and is the editor-in-chief of a forthcoming journal. Is this a new journal coming out that be? Pardon? It's now live. Live, not, live, not forthcoming, but actually live. Uh, um, current addiction reports. He's received multiple international and national awards for his work, consults with many, many federal agencies around addictive disorders. <clears throat> He's participated in two DSM-5 research work groups addressing topics related to gambling, impulse control, and addiction. We're gonna have a really interesting talk tonight, as you can, as you can see. But before we launch him into it, <clears throat> I'd like to say a little bit about Hal Dumon, who's um, a former dean of the School of Social Work and in whom this, uh, for whom this lecture is, um, is named and held every year. Harold Dumon and Marguerite F. Dumon um, established this lecture with the necessary resources for an annual lecture by a noted authority on the subject of alcohol and related addictions. Um, this is held at this time every year, as I understand it. Harold Dumont served in the U.S. Army and was a veteran of World War II. He, um, he joined the Army when he was 18, uh, fought in the Battle of the Bulge, <coughs> was captured in Germany, and was in a concentration camp for four months returned to this country where he did, um, where he f went to college. <clears throat> Remember these 18 year olds at that time went off to fight a war and then came home and went to college where he received his BA and MA from Tufts. He went into social work after that when he received his um, uh, PhD in social welfare from Brandeis. He was very active in many, many social work organizations he continually reflected scholarship, leadership, and a willingness to explore uncharted areas of basic social and public health issues throughout his professional career. He was a teacher, an administrator, a researcher, public policy and program person, um, an advocate. His areas of emphasis and expertise included substance abuse, mental health, mental retardation, criminal justice, and community health. He had a 43-year um, career as a social worker, <clears throat> working in Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New Hampshire, and consulting in more than 20 states around the country. He was a driving force behind federal and state legislative initiatives related to mental health services and research in the mental health al and alcoholism, among other areas. 
He was the chief executive officer of several uh, nonprofits and um, dean of the School of Social Work at Rutgers, 1977 to 1987. <clears throat> this is the kind of career students that you get with that MSW. You know, you get to do all these many, many things over a long career. Harold um, passed away in September 2011 at the age of 87, and we'd like to thank his wife, Marguerite, who's ill and was not able to be here tonight, and the rest of his family, including um, John Riley, for supporting and endowing this lecture. Um, the fund also provides up to three scholarships for MSW students who are doing field placements in settings that involve alcohol or other addictions. I think it's important to take some time to talk about this, even though there are relatively few people in the room who remember Hal Damone, um, because it's important to reflect back on um, people who've contributed to a place like a school of social work, and uh, to think about careers that have gone before, and to give some thanks for people who um, set in motion some events that allow us to gather on a regular basis to focus on a particular thing. So thank you so much for being here. And now we will send you off um, for 40, 45 minutes on the mysteries of brain and behavior and addiction. Is that a fair summary? I'll try to live up to it. Okay, good. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for selecting me as this year's speaker. It's quite an honor, and I'll try to live up to uh, the expectations. Uh, for me, this is a bit of a homecoming since I grew up in Highland Park, and it's actually uh, quite impressive to see all of the changes on this campus uh, that have occurred uh, since the last time I was here on Livingston. So with that being said, I'll be talking today about addictions and how we view addictions and how we might help people with addictions, uh, particularly given DSM-5 and changing notions about what might represent addictive behaviors. As I do uh, with all of my talks these days, I have a series of uh, disclosures with respect to relationships with uh, the pharmaceutical, uh, gambling, and legal industries. And where I often start uh, talks like this is to think about uh, addiction from a historical perspective and to think about uh, how the term addiction has been used over time. If we go back to the original uh, usage of the word, it's derived from a Latin word meaning bound to or enslaved by. And in its original formulation, it was not linked to substance use behaviors. However, going back several hundred years, it became linked to excessive patterns of alcohol use and then uh, excessive <coughs> patterns of drug use, such that by the time of DSM-3R, people on the Substance Use Disorders Committee uh, felt apparently uniformly that addiction could be defined by compulsive drug use. However, over the past 10 to 15 years, I think there's been a reconsideration of what are the core components of addiction and whether non-substance behaviors might represent addictions. So people like Howard Schaefer and others have uh, proposed several core components of addiction, such as continued behavior despite adverse consequences, diminished or lost control or compulsive engagement in a behavior, and a craving or an appetitive urge state that immediately precedes engagement in a behavior. So if one thinks of these as the core elements of addiction, then perhaps non-substance behaviors might be considered addictions. And I think this might be uh, highlighted uh, work over the past uh, 10 years or the decade of the uh, 2000s or noughts. Uh, by a couple of articles that uh, Constance Holden authored in the journal Science. So on the left, um, there is a, a title that says, Behavioral Addictions, Do They Exist? I'm going to use this arrow to highlight since uh, I was testing the pointer and it really didn't make it through the plants very well. And, and for those people who have really good eyesight, above the question, behavioral addictions, do they exist? <laughs> it, it, it says, aided by brain imaging advances, uh, scientists are looking for evidence that uh, compulsive engagement in non-substance behaviors might 
represent addictions or whether there are similarities in reward-related processes across these uh, behaviors. Then she wrote an article that was published in 2010 that had the title Behavioral Addictions Debut and Proposed DSM-5. <laughs> and this was in advance of DSM-5 and was uh, highlighting the work that was being done and the proposal to move uh, conditions like pathological gambling together with substance use disorders in the DSM-5. So to take a step back, uh, for people who may not be familiar with the history of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, this is the book uh, that has the nomenclature for uh, mental health conditions. The original DSM uh, came out uh, after World War II in 1952. Uh, with revisions in uh, 1968 and then particularly in 1980 where there was a movement to try to use available data uh, to generate a, a set of diagnoses that could be um, empirically supported as well as then utilized uh, across geographic locations. Uh, there was then another revision to that in the mid to late 80s and then a revision in 1994, and then the DSM-IV-TR came out in 2000. Uh, from 1987 to uh, up until DSM-5, there had been relatively little change in the, the DSM. Um, however, uh, in the public domain, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's quite all right. Um, if that person is here, you're wanted in the office. <laughs> So Time Magazine uh, began asking the question uh, as what constitutes a mental health condition. So they, they framed it as what counts as crazy. And they asked the question whether certain behaviors might be the new abnormal, uh, looking at excessive engagement in eating, uh, internet use, or sexual behaviors. And so the DSM process uh, took about 10 years or so. Uh, there were multiple stages. There were several uh, research work groups, and by several, there were about 15 different research work groups that covered the different uh, domains of mental health conditions. I was involved in two of the work groups, the substance use disorder work group and the impulsive compulsive spectrum disorders work group. <coughs> And I specifically was asked to consider the question whether gambling and uh, other impulse control behaviors might be considered either as addictions or as impulsive compulsive spectrum disorders. Uh, following the, the work of the research work groups, there were committees then that considered the diagnoses uh, and made proposals for DSM-5. I had been invited to participate in the Substance Use Disorders Committee, uh, but because of my involvement with the pharmaceutical gambling and legal industries and the concerns about being at arm's length, uh, it was decided that I, I stay at arm's length from the process. So some of the, the work from the work group and the committee prompted the moving of pathological gambling together with substance use disorders into a substance-related and addictive disorders category. This group, this committee, also considered internet and video gaming uh, as well as some other behaviors. And they felt that there were insufficient data at the time to warrant inclusion within the general section of the DSM-5, although they did provide a provisional diagnostic criteria for research purposes for some of these. So the, the, the movement of taking pathological gambling and grouping it together with substance use disorders was somewhat controversial. Uh, but I think that there were uh, a number of studies that supported similarities between pathological gambling and substance use disorders, and I'll be talking about those later on. There was also a change in terms of the name of the condition. Pathological gambling was changed to gambling disorder uh, with respect to concerns about the use <coughs> of the term pathological and what it might uh, represent with respect to how people might feel about the, the term, people seeking treatment, uh, as well as um, other considerations. There are also some other changes for people. Okay, 
Um, we're, we're not going to go wireless. We're going to stay connected. So the, there was a change in terms of the removal of the illegal acts criterion. So this is the uh, criterion that existed in DSM-4 but is not there in DSM-5 for pathological gambling or gambling disorder that uh, people engage in illegal behaviors in order to support uh, their gambling. They, uh, there was also the change in terms of the diagnostic threshold. So instead of needing to meet five of ten inclusionary criteria for pathological gambling or gambling disorder, uh, you needed to meet four of nine to meet the criteria, the threshold for a disorder. Now, while that, um, that decision was driven by a number of factors in that, uh, for example, this would not change the prevalence estimate of the uh, condition, it does create a difference between gambling disorders and substance use disorders in that uh, in the current DSM-5, a threshold of two or more inclusionary criteria is needed to meet the uh, a diagnosis of a substance use disorder uh, where it's four or more for gambling. And this difference, I think, it warrants significant consideration in that it will uh, change the prevalence estimates of the disorder as well as uh, the potential impact of the disorder. So if pathological gambling uh, was moved uh, from DSM-4 to DSM-5, it must have been sitting somewhere else in the DSM. And that uh, other location was in the category of impulse control disorders not elsewhere classified. And as this name suggests, this is a rather, rather heterogeneous grouping of disorders uh, that included pathological gambling, uh, kleptomania, <coughs> so difficulties with uh, stealing <coughs> items, pyromania, repetitive interfering patterns of fire setting, intermittent explosive disorder, uh, which is difficulties uh, controlling aggressive behavior on the spur of the moment. Trichotillomania, which is repetitive interfering patterns of hair pulling and sometimes involving hair eating as well. And then a, an impulse control disorder, not uh, otherwise specified category, which could be used to diagnose conditions relating to excessive engagement in shopping or buying, sexual behaviors, computer use, amongst other uh, conditions. From a clinical perspective, uh, I would argue that these conditions often go unrecognized and undiagnosed within clinical settings. Uh, some work in which we were involved with uh, John Grant supports this notion, where we looked at uh, a little over 200 uh, adults who were being admitted to a psychiatric hospital, and then a little over 100 adolescents who were being admitted for uh, mental health considerations. And what we found was that for the adults, we found that over 30% uh, when we formally uh, screened and did formal diagnostic assessments, over 30% had a current impulse control disorder. And for the adolescents, it was over 40%. And this contrasted with the 1% to 2% of individuals who were given an impulse control disorder diagnosis upon admission. So with respect to the clinical characteristics of these individuals, in the adult sample, we found that there were no differences in, yes, question. Yes, have you found any differences Great question. In fact, the, the, I was just about to say that. So um, what we found was that there were no differences in admission diagnoses for mood, psychotic, or substance use disorders in the group of adults uh, with and without impulse control disorders. So this suggests that the impulse control disorders cut across a broad spectrum of psychiatric conditions. And these data are consistent with uh, data from community samples in the general population, which suggests that disorders like problem pathological gambling uh, co-occur with a broad range of what used to be axis one as well as axis two disorders. But you said on admission, Yeah, so uh, I don't know if we looked at those data, but I think the, uh, and it would be interesting to look at that, but I think the, the point, uh, one important point from a clinical perspective is that these conditions co-occur um, not only with substance use disorders, but with mood, anxiety, psychotic, and uh, personality disorders. <laughs> 
Amongst the adolescents, we found a somewhat different pattern. So we found that there was no difference in terms of externalizing disorders. Uh, but there was a difference in the associations between the presence of an impulse control disorder and internalizing disorders like mood and anxiety disorders. This may have reflected the high rates of externalizing disorders in the sample, so there may have been a ceiling effect. Uh, but the, the most statistically significant finding uh, was an association with prior hospitalization. So it suggests that this group of individuals may either have more severe uh, forms or patterns of mental illness, or perhaps that some aspect of their mental health care is not being effectively targeted uh, during treatment, and this is leading to recurrent hospitalization. So I'm going to shift gears a bit and move from a clinical setting and into the community. And these are data from a high school survey that we conducted in the state of Connecticut. And uh, we surveyed uh, between 4,000 and 5,000 individuals uh, with uh, several thousand individuals providing uh, complete gambling data relating to DSM-4 criteria for pathological gambling. And we stratified the sample into non-gamblers, uh, which represented about 20% of the sample, <coughs> low-risk gamblers uh, who reported gambling but not meeting any diagnostic criteria for pathological gambling, at-risk gamblers who gambled and met one to two diagnostic criteria, and then problem pathological uh, gambling individuals um, who met three or more criteria. And this represented about 10% of the sample, and about half of those individuals met uh, full diagnostic criteria for pathological gambling. So this is about 5% of the high school students uh, met criteria for uh, pathological gambling. And these data are consistent with uh, what other groups who study adolescent gambling behaviors find. So for example, Jeffrey Derevensky uh, and others in, uh, in Canada uh, find high rates of gambling problems amongst adolescents. We're also interested in the clinical correlates. So for example, what are the relationships <laughs> with substance use disorders? And here we looked at uh, tobacco use. And these slides are going to follow the same pattern of non-gamblers, low-risk gamblers, at-risk gamblers, and problem pathological gamblers. And these are uh, going to reflect uh, percentages here, and odd ratios are going to be shown down here. And uh, what we see is that uh, we see a somewhat stepwise pattern with respect to um, a uh, initiation of tobacco use. So as problem gambling severity increases, uh, the individuals are uh, less likely to have never tried tobacco. However, if you look at the uh, regular tobacco smokers, here we see more of a pronounced difference uh, within the problem pathological gambling group, suggesting that it's really within the people who have more severe gambling problems who are uh, getting into, in the high school sample, um, uh, more habitual or compulsive patterns of tobacco use. We also saw something similar uh, with respect to past month alcohol use, where we uh, defined um, uh, drinking days over the last 30 days, uh, looking at uh, never regular drinkers, light drinkers, moderate drinkers, and heavy alcohol drinkers. And again, more of a stepwise uh, pattern for the never using, and more of this concentration of um, individuals within the problem pathological gambling group uh, for the uh, heavy alcohol users. With marijuana use, we also see an association. And again, these odds ratios uh, here are between uh, three and four and are very statistically significant. With uh, designer drug use and other drug use, so drugs like ecstasy or GHB or ketamine. And again, uh, for the problem pathological gambling group, they seem to be the group that has the uh, particularly high uh, rates of use. And then with uh, past year dysphoria or depression, and we see odds ratios uh, between three and five uh, for um, having felt sad or helpless for two weeks or more uh, within the uh, problem pathological gambling group as compared to some of the lower risk gambling group. With respect to aggressive behaviors, we also see a concentration uh, within the problem pathological gambling group 
And again, these uh, odds ratios are uh, statistically significantly elevated here uh, between six and seven. And uh, other forms of potentially aggressive behavior, such as carrying a weapon. Uh, but here we see more of a stepwise increase with problem gambling severity. Now, we didn't see relationships uh, across all measures. So, for example, we did not see a relationship with uh, body mass index. And this is a relationship that we see in samples of adults, a relationship between problem pathological gambling and elevated uh, body mass indices. Uh, so it suggests that perhaps there may be developmental differences uh, with respect to uh, weight or food as compared to gambling. So with respect to some of the data that led to the movement of problem pathological gambling together with substance use disorders, um, some of the, the factors are epidemiological with respect to high rates of co-occurrence. Uh, some factors represent similarities across the disorders with respect to their clinical courses. So for example, uh, developmentally, there are high rates in adolescents and young adults, lower rates in older adults for both pathological gambling and substance use disorders, a telescoping phenomenon that was originally described for alcohol use disorders, uh, later for drug use disorders, has we found this um, and other groups, uh, one in Minnesota, one in Brazil have, have found this. And this pattern is that uh, women as compared with men uh, tend to initiate engagement in the behavior on average later in life, but the time frame between initial engagement and development of a problem is foreshortened or telescoped in women as compared with men. And then there are similarities in terms of their clinical characteristics. Some of these are captured in the diagnostic criteria for uh, the disorders. And then what I'll be talking about um, for a fair uh, proportion of the talk is similarities in terms of the biologies, both at genetic levels and at brain-based levels, and to think about how those might relate to uh, treatment. So these are a few cards that I scanned in from my son's Yu-Gi-Oh card collection when uh, collecting Yu-Gi-Oh cards occupied a large uh, part of his motivational behavioral repertoire. And, <laughs> And, and I included them to highlight some of the individual difference factors that might link uh, gambling behaviors and substance use behaviors. So uh, on the one hand, we have uh, Mr. Volcano, who is a seemingly mild-mannered creature who has an extremely volatile temper. And he might be the, certain per the type of person who may rush recklessly into certain behaviors. So we're thinking about some of the constructs that may underlie engagement in a, a variety of risk behaviors, and uh, two that we focused on uh, are impulsivity and compulsivity. So going back now over a decade, Jerry Muller and colleagues defined impulsivity as a predisposition toward rapid, unplanned reactions to internal or external stimuli, with diminished regard to the negative consequences of these reactions to the impulsive individual or to others. So if we take this as a working definition of impulsivity, one might be struck by several features. One, it overlaps with some of the core elements of addiction. So for example, continued engagement in behavior despite adverse consequences. Uh, two is that it may be relevant to a broad range of psychiatric disorders, uh, so that studying it may have um, implications for uh, not only gambling and substance use disorders, but a broader range of uh, conditions. And it may also uh, help explain uh, some of the, the comorbidity or high frequencies of co-occurrence of different disorders. And then I think importantly, uh, it's a complicated uh, construct that uh, probably contains multiple domains. And when people have performed factor analyses, they typically identify two or more uh, domains that are uh, independent. Uh, two of those tend to be uh, choice impulsivity and rapid response impulsivity. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Compulsivity, on the other hand, um, in uh, another work group, we agreed upon the definition of repetitive <coughs> behavior uh, without apparent adaptive function. And this is less well studied than impulsivity, but I think uh, also warrants uh, important consideration. <coughs> 
So um, some of the similarities uh, with respect to impulsivity might be reflected in uh, decision making, and particularly decision making that involves risk and reward. And individuals with gambling problems and substance use problems um, often perform disadvantageously on decision making tasks, which are frequently termed gambling tasks. And this may reflect a tendency uh, to select smaller immediate rewards over larger delayed rewards. And this um, tendency has been uh, termed uh, more rapid temporal discounting or delay discounting. And from a clinical perspective, um, we and other groups have related uh, rapid temporal discounting uh, to clinically relevant measures. So for example, treatment outcome amongst adolescents, adolescent smokers who are trying to quit smoking. One of the brain regions that uh, was early implicated, uh, going back to the case study of Phineas Gage uh, about 150 years ago, in decision making is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So when we initiated brain imaging studies of individuals with gambling problems, this was a brain region that we thought would be implicated. And we and other groups uh, across a variety of different tasks have found that individuals with pathological gambling or with substance use disorders tend to show relatively diminished activation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, um, either during a cognitive control task like the Stroop cover word interference task, uh, during the viewing of gambling related materials, during the outcome phase of reward processing. A group in Germany found uh, relatively diminished activation uh, during simulated gambling in the group with uh, gambling problems, and the degree of brain activation correlated inversely with problem gambling severity, such that the more severe the gambling problem, the less that this brain region activated uh, during simulated gambling. And then during a decision-making task, individuals with uh, substance use disorders with or without gambling problems uh, showed relatively diminished activation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex on the Iowa gambling task. Now, another important brain region that's been implicated in addiction and in reward processing and reward-based learning is the ventral striatum. So this is a brain region that contains the nucleus accumbens and is a key part of um, the ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens uh, mesolimbic uh, pathway. And a widely used task that's used during uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, to assess reward processing is the monetary incentive delay task. And this task can separate out anticipatory phases and notification or outcome phases of reward processing. And going back uh, close to a decade, uh, people have found that adults with alcohol dependence uh, show relatively diminished activation of the ventral striatum during the anticipation <coughs> phase of reward processing. This seems to um, also relate to people who may be at elevated risk for problems <coughs> with alcohol use, including adolescents and uh, those family history positive versus family history negative for alcohol dependence, as well as to a range of other uh, conditions that are either addictive or characterized by impaired impulse control. So nicotine dependence, pathological gambling, and binge eating disorder. And I think importantly, in several of these groups, in alcohol dependence and in pathological gambling, the relatively diminished activation of the ventral striatum during the anticipation phase of uh, reward processing correlates with impulsivity, such that the more impulsive the individuals rate themselves, um, the less that the ventral striatum activates during uh, this phase of reward processing. And this resonates with a, a larger literature that shows relatively diminished activation of the striatum, and particularly the ventral striatum in pathological gambling, either during uh, the viewing of gambling-related uh, materials, uh, during the anticipation of uh, monetary reward, or during uh, simulated gambling. So if there are these similarities between um, alcohol dependence and pathological gambling, um, how can we use that to uh, benefit? And I, I include this as a, a segue. Uh, this is a, an actual piece of gambling paraphernalia from uh, over 50 years ago. And these are the precursors to scratch off lottery tickets. So these are uh, push cards. 
And here, uh, the individuals would pay 10 cents, push out one of the beer steins, and there would be numbers on the back. And the lucky um, uh, cards would receive either one beer or two beers. So it highlights some of the complex relationships between um, alcohol uh, and gambling behaviors. So from a biological perspective, people have used large samples of twins to investigate the relationship uh, between pathological gambling and alcohol dependence and estimate the genetic and environmental contributions to the conditions. And there exist both uh, environmental and genetic contributions. So if we think that there are these similarities at a biological level, including at a genetic level, might we think that some of the medications that are helpful for people with um, alcohol dependence might be used to help people with gambling problems? So there, there are no medications that have FDA indications for pathological gambling or um, some of the impulse control disorders from DSM-4, uh, but several of the ones that are approved for alcohol dependence, disulfiram, naltrexone, acamprosate, warrant consideration for uh, people with gambling problems. And we thought that naltrexone, given its proposed mechanism of action to target uh, the mesolimbic dopamine system, uh, warranted a particular consideration. So we were involved in several studies uh, of either naltrexone or another opioid antagonist, nalmefene. And uh, in these clinical trials, there have been four uh, that have been performed to date that have found uh, nalmefene or naltrexone to be superior to placebo to varying degrees um, in the treatment of pathological gambling. However, there were a number of people who received naltrexone who did not uh, fare well or improve uh, to a clinically significant extent. So we were interested in understanding what were some of the individual difference factors that might relate to treatment outcome. So we took data from two of these studies uh, and looked at uh, 214 people who had either received naltrexone or nalmefene. And the factor that we found that was most strongly associated with treatment outcome <coughs> was a family history of alcoholism. So this, the individuals who had a positive family history were more likely to show a positive treatment response to naltrexone, suggesting that there might be some um, endophenotypic or intermediary phenotype, some biological construct that links um, these disorders that might be effectively targeted with uh, an opioid antagonist. Um, also similar to the alcohol literature, the individuals who had strong gambling urges at treatment onset uh, were more likely to show a positive uh, response to uh, the opioid antagonist. We saw a different pattern when we looked at the sample of individuals who received placebo, and the factor that was most significantly associated with a positive uh, placebo response was younger age. So it, it gave us some um, confidence that what we were seeing in the naltrexone, nalmefene sample was different from the placebo sample. And so from these data, as well as other data, we've uh, proposed a uh, treatment algorithm, a pharmacological treatment algorithm, uh, which I won't go into significant detail, uh, but it uh, was published last year. We've also been interested in thinking about how these underlying constructs like impulsivity and compulsivity may relate to treatment outcome. And in one study of uh, paroxetine, uh, we found that both measures of impulsivity and compulsivity uh, self-reported uh, measures using uh, the Izenc and the Padua inventory respectively uh, correlated uh, with uh, problem gambling severity. Uh, but if we looked at the changes over time during treatment uh, and the changes in problem gambling severity, those correlated most strongly with changes in impulsivity during treatment, uh, but not changes in compulsivity. However, in a, a separate trial of memantine, uh, we found that there were both uh, changes on behavioral measures of impulsivity and compulsivity, uh, perhaps um, more so on the compulsivity side on a, an interdimensional, extradimensional set shifting task. 
So I think these, both of these studies used relatively small sample sizes, uh, but provide uh, provocative uh, leads that I think warrant uh, additional follow-up. And then another uh, area in which we've been uh, pursuing, uh, and we've been pursuing more actively uh, in the drug abuse field than in the uh, problem gambling field, is to relate brain activation measures uh, to treatment outcome. But in this uh, rel really small sample uh, of a uh, placebo-controlled trial of <coughs> N-acetylcysteine uh, for uh, people with gambling problems, we found that pretreatment uh, brain activation measures, including in the ventral striatum and uh, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, related to uh, symptom severity at treatment onset and then changes um, over uh, time during treatment. So very early findings, but I think this will be important to pursue. And then we've also been interested in thinking about uh, what uh, we might do to impact uh, policy. So some of our uh, work uh, has looked at internet gambling and there have been changes in multiple states uh, about the legality of internet gambling. And what we found uh, amongst adolescents in the high school sample was that um, adolescent internet <laughs> gambling uh, was linked more strongly to poor academic function, heavy drinking, and non-peer gambling. And this last aspect, um, that the gambling might be done more in isolation than other adolescent risk behaviors, I think warrants consideration. Uh, another study that I think um, people here in New Jersey um, have uh, used with respect to prevention efforts uh, was uh, looking at the relationship between receiving a, a lottery ticket gift as a high school student um, and uh, a number of factors, so um, how they perceived gambling. And uh, what we found was that the gift receipt was linked to more permissive gambling attitudes, earlier age at gambling onset, and stronger links between problem gambling severity and early age at gambling onset. So I think it raises a number of questions about what policies we might want to have in place with respect to these behaviors. And from a, a broader base theoretical um, uh, perspective, we've been thinking about uh, problem gambling or gambling levels of uh, different levels of problem gambling severity and how they might interact at different uh, biological uh, and environmental uh, factors, uh, including with respect to individual differences, so that we may think about how best to approach policy. So I'm going to move from uh, gambling to uh, obesity. And it's a rather rough break. Uh, and just to get an idea of the prevalence, uh, about uh, two-thirds of the general adult population um, in the United States, and this is not unique to the United States, is either overweight or obese. And from a public health perspective, um, overweight and obese conditions are associated uh, with significant uh, morbidity and mortality and public health uh, and medical costs. And this represents a significant change over the past several decades. So if one looks at the time from the early 60s um, to uh, the early 80s or <coughs> 70s, there really, in either women or men, there were not uh, substantial changes in terms of the prevalence, uh, but then in the following decades, there were uh, substantial increases in the prevalence. And I think that this has uh, been gaining uh, more attention recently, and one might think about the ways in which uh, food and eating behaviors have been viewed historically, and this has largely been viewed from a metabolic and endocrine, endocrine, endocrinological point of view. And uh, given that there have been changes in the food environment, and that food like uh, a number of uh, food intake, like a num number of other behaviors, represents a motivated behavior, one might think about this from a, a different perspective including from a, an addiction perspective. So uh, people have raised the question whether food addiction exists. Uh, some uh, colleagues over the pond have um, uh, written an article, Obesity in the Brain, How Convincing is the Addiction Model, uh, questioning this uh, formulation. We wrote back a correspondence um, uh, 
where we titled it Tossing the Baby Out with the Bathwater After a Brief Rinse, the potential downside of dismissing food addiction based on limited data. And they wrote back a commentary um, uh, asking if there is a baby in the bathwater. So I, I think that there is significant debate about this question. Um, and we believe that food addiction um, is relevant to consider it might be applicable to certain groups of individuals with obesity. And one condition that we've been um, particularly interested in is uh, binge eating disorder. Um, given the uh, similarities between binge eating disorder and uh, substance dependence or substance use disorders, including this impaired impulse control. So we've applied some of the same brain imaging measures that we have uh, to substance use disorders and um, problem pathological gambling uh, to individuals with binge eating disorder. And in this study, we looked at individuals um, who uh, were, had binge eating disorder and obesity, those who had obesity without binge eating disorder who were matched on BMI, and then a lean uh, control comparison group. And if we look at the, the top here, um, in the binge eating disorder versus the obesity group, we see some of the same between group differences that we see in the substance use disorders and the uh, problem pathological gambling uh, comparisons during the reward anticipation phase in this region of the brain that has been linked to uh, reward processing. Furthermore, if we take the um, group of individuals with binge eating disorder and look at the relationship with uh, clinically relevant measures like treatment outcome, in this case, we looked at the individuals who, after receiving cognitive behavioral therapy, were either continuing to binge or those who had remitted from binging. Uh, we see uh, some of the same brain regions, including uh, ventral striatal activation, um, as well as ventral medial prefrontal cortical activation during the anticipatory and outcome phases respectively um, linked to treatment outcome. So even though the group of individuals with binge eating disorder as a group is showing relatively diminished striatal activation, within the group of individuals with binge eating disorder there are individual differences so that those people who are showing the least activation are showing the worst treatment outcome. We also think it's important to think about this from a developmental perspective. Uh, people have proposed that adolescents, as compared to adults, may engage in uh, more risk-taking behaviors due to differences in relative maturation states of different brain regions, such that subcortical or promotivation brain regions tend to mature more rapidly than <coughs> those brain regions that are involved in behavioral control, like the prefrontal cortex. Uh, we think that this has uh, important implications for how we might approach treatment. Um, but some of our data uh, tends to, um, to corroborate uh, this hypothesis. So when we image individuals who are adults versus adolescents uh, with, during the same type of fMRI task, here there are individualized guided imagery stressful conditions or favorite food conditions. In the adults, we see activation largely of uh, cortical brain regions. And in the adolescents, we see activation largely of subcortical brain regions and in some cases relative deactivation, uh, particularly during the stress condition, but also during the food condition of uh, cortical brain regions. So we think that this also has policy implications and Kelly Brownell, who used to be at the Red Center at Yale, who has been a big proponent of thinking about uh, different interventions like uh, soda taxes, uh, amongst others. And we've thought about um, how we might uh, translate some of the findings that have been, or some of the approaches that have been effective in reducing adolescent engagement, for example, in smoking, how they might be applicable to, to food. Now, another area that I think warrants uh, consideration is internet use and technology because there's been a revolution in the availability and use of digital technologies. Although uh, the DSM-5 committee uh, did not feel that there was sufficient data to include a set of diagnostic criteria in the formal section, they did um, describe uh, internet gaming disorder, and they modeled this largely after gambling disorder. Uh, I think this is very <coughs> controversial in that 
Uh, it combines video gaming and internet use and perhaps uh, does not capture all aspects of internet use that might be problematic for people or all aspects of video gaming that might be problematic for people. Before these criteria came out, we separated those two constructs and we looked at problematic internet use and problematic video gaming uh, within our sample of high school students. And what we found was that uh, amongst uh, the high school students, about 4% met what we defined as criteria as uh, for problematic internet use. And this was defined as having um, all three of these measures, an irresistible urge, growing tension relieved by internet use, and trying to cut back on internet use. And this estimate of 4% is similar to um, other larger scale community-based studies, for example, from Europe that have used somewhat different uh, criteria. We also found some uh, similarities with gambling behaviors. So, uh, for example, um, with respect to internet use, boys reported spending more time on the internet and girls uh, were more likely to think that they had a problem with internet use. And these findings of girls having uh, more problems with digital technology seems to be supported by a, a community-based study that uh, was performed recently in Germany. So I think warrants important consideration. We also found some uh, racial, ethnic, cultural differences with respect to uh, more frequent uh, acknowledgement in Asian and Hispanic youth. And then uh, we also found relationships uh, with negative health measures, for example, of substance use, depression, and aggression. Uh, but more research is needed, particularly since we didn't um, break out the different types of internet use. And uh, for example, uh, Hans-Jürgen Rumpf uh, in Germany has broken out different types of video gaming versus social <coughs> networking. And these likely have important considerations for um, who might develop problems as well as the different approaches that might be taken for helping people. And then with respect to video gaming, uh, we found that uh, for boys in the sample, video gaming was a normative behavior, where about three quarters of the boys, as compared to uh, a little less than 30% of the girls, reported uh, playing video games. Uh, and video game playing uh, amongst the boys was not associated with negative health measures. In fact, it seemed to be protective against smoking. It was associated with lower odds of uh, tobacco smoking. Um, however, amongst girls, we found that video game playing was associated uh, with depression, uh, fights, and carrying a weapon, so both mood and uh, aggressive behavior uh, domains. However, if we look then at the uh, groups uh, with uh, problematic video gaming, about 5% uh, of the video gamers or 2 to 3% of the sample um, had problematic video gaming. And across both sexes, the correlates of problematic video gaming included tobacco use, drug use, depression, and getting into uh, serious fights. So these um, findings suggest that uh, while video gaming uh, may not be problematic, particularly for boys, problematic video gaming seems to be uh, uh, pose difficulties uh, across the sexes. With respect to thinking about the neurobiologies, there are both similarities and uh, differences uh, across problematic internet use, problematic video gaming, uh, problem pathological gambling, and substance use disorders. We've uh, published on this recently. And uh, some of this seems to relate back to how people uh, process rewards. So for example, the adult, we found that um, adolescents with at-risk problematic internet use uh, show relatively blunted uh, responses during reward uh, feedback as compared to adolescents without at-risk problematic internet use. So I, I think we've gone through a, a broad range of uh, topics over uh, the, the talk. I think there's still a lot that we need to learn and understand, and there's currently considerable debate. I think that we've made significant advances in terms of our understanding of uh, gambling behaviors and other behaviors, uh, such as uh, tech use of technology and, um, uh, and how we might think about uh, eating behaviors uh, are still more debated. 
And we hope that by uh, gathering information from biological, behavioral, clinical perspectives, that we might integrate this information and help um, better understand these conditions and how to help people through better policy, prevention, treatment efforts. And there's a, a whole slew of people who have contributed in many important ways to this work, as well as funding agencies who supported this work. Thank you. Yeah, so the question was if there's any other, if there are other relationships, for example, with uh, self-harm and uh, self-injurious behaviors. It's relatively understudied, but there are data to link. So what's looked at, what has been looked at more closely are relationships, uh, for example, with suicidal uh, behaviors and uh, particularly with respect to problematic gambling. Uh, there are higher rates of um, uh, suicidal thoughts and uh, behaviors, and uh, there have been gambling-related thoughts that promote the uh, gambling-related uh, behaviors or experiences that may promote engagement in that form of self-injurious behavior. But um, cutting behavior is less well studied uh, amongst the impulse control uh, group and warrants further investigation. Yeah, so the question was, can we comment on uh, marijuana uh, use in, the, um, in relationship to gambling or eating or, or addiction? Yeah, so um, marijuana uh, use um, has been considered uh, as an addiction. It's in the, the DSM-5 uh, with respect to uh, either cannabis disorder, I believe is the, the current name. So its relationship to other uh, behaviors, as I showed the slide, it's linked to uh, problematic uh, gambling behaviors. With respect to eating behaviors, cannabinoids tend to have a, a pro-appetitive effect so people describe having the munchies when they're high, for example. Uh, and people have been investigating whether uh, cannabinoid uh, targets, so drugs that may alter the function of cannabinoid systems, may be helpful with respect to weight loss. Uh, there has been debate as to the legalization of marijuana, and different states have been uh, making it legal. So, for example, Colorado, I think a few years back, uh, made marijuana more available, and the extent to which this influences use is still being studied. Does that address the question? Okay, I think there were probably two or three questions there, so I'll, I'll do my best to do. <laughs> so one of the questions was with respect to executive function and neuroplasticity and uh, how that might relate to substance uh, abuse. And that in and of itself is a large uh, field. So people um, have looked at neurocognitive functioning uh, in various states. Uh, one group that has been looking at this that I think has found some relatively surprising results is the Cambridge group uh, led by uh, Trevor Robbins and Barbara Sahakian and, and, and others. And they found, they looked at people who um, either have stimulant dependence, uh, people who are unaffected siblings, uh, 
um, of those individuals who have stimulant dependence. And uh, I control comparison group that's unrelated to those individuals. And surprisingly, what, what they expected was that they would find the individuals with stimulant dependence to be most impaired as compared to the control group and the unaffected individuals to be relatively in between in terms of uh, performance and brain structure and function. What they found was that the group um, with, uh, who were unaffected but related were much more close to the individuals with stimulant dependence. Um, both with respect to brain structure and function and the performance. Uh, other studies um, in, in this suggest that there are other factors that may distinguish those groups, but I think it was relatively surprising. Other groups have followed individuals over time um, to look at various factors. One of the things that we're doing is looking at people before and after treatment and uh, long-term follow-up. So people with cocaine dependence who are coming in uh, to engage in behavioral or pharmacological therapies and trying to understand changes in executive function over time as well as changes in brain structure and function over time. I didn't have time to go into that work, uh, but some of our findings are consistent with some of the cross-sectional data that I was showing um, in the, the gambling field. My, my impression is that uh, we will be able to, and, and we will be able to improve executive function in a way that um, will hopefully help people remain abstinent uh, from uh, drug use. And people have been employing either cognitive enhancing agents, um, like uh, drugs that influence the acetylcholinergic systems, or uh, using behavioral therapies that our skill training or executive functioning training uh, approaches to try to um, have people adapt more uh, effective decision-making strategies or build cognitive functions so that when they're in uh, certain situations that may predispose to risk-taking behaviors, then they might make better choices. So uh, what are the, the implications for social workers with respect to how this is reconceptualized in DSM-5? So and then there was a question about how this relates to trauma. Okay. Yeah, so what are the treatment implications? I think that there are multiple implications that go beyond treatment. Um, so with respect, you know, there are some really direct kind of logistical changes. So for example, billing. The DSM-5 is used for, for billing and um, how this might be incorporated into the Affordable Care Act is also an area of uh, question. So Tom McClellan, who was involved in looking at uh, substance use disorders in the Affordable Care Act, was invited to uh, give a talk to a, uh, at a gambling conference, and he didn't mention gambling at all um, in his talk. Um, so that didn't give me high hopes that there would be significant changes uh, with respect to DSM-5. Um, with respect to the regrouping with substance use disorders. That's a bit tricky. I think there are multiple implications. So one implication from a research perspective, and that's one of the things that we're very much concerned about, is that um, this movement solidifies NIMH's stance that gambling really isn't in their domain. NIAAA, which is, focuses on alcohol, uh, and NIDA, which focuses on drug, um, particularly during this uh, stringent time, says that this is not uh, within their domain. So it does not leave a federal source for um, scientific inquiry into gambling-related behaviors. Um, how this may impact from a more clinical, like in a SAMHSA level way, um, it's unclear. SAMHSA seems a little more sympathetic to thinking about co-occurring disorders. 
um, in, in some ways, uh, from a social work clinical treatment perspective, treatment will go on um, regardless of whether pathological gambling sits within um, the impulse control disorder section or the uh, substance use disorder section. Um, and, and I think this varies a bit from state to state. Uh, in our state, in Connecticut, we've had a state um, a state-supported problem gambling services program that uh, provides uh, support for counselors to treat individuals with gambling problems, families of people with gambling problems. So, and we've taken a very multidisciplinary, integrative approach that includes psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, um, people in recovery. Uh, and tries to individualize the, the care to help people as best as we can given the available data. I think that will continue. And, you know, uh, and there are people here in this room who may be able to speak more um, clearly on the New Jersey situation uh, than, than I can. So um, the question is about prevention programs and what works best for adolescents. <coughs> so um, you had mentioned a program about skills training. I would argue that there are um, several other important approaches that warrant consideration as very effective um, strategies for reducing adolescent risk behaviors. So one that comes to mind is raising the, the taxes on tobacco. and that. Um, has a very substantial effect, I think, on adolescent uh, behavior. It does on adults, but adolescents have less money, uh, less income, and thus may be um, more preferentially targeted by increasing taxation. And uh, I think that uh, we've been trying to think about what are some of the questions that might help people. So for example, when the National Council on Problem Gambling goes to Capitol Hill, what will help them um, with respect to making informed statements about what's going to be helpful from a policy perspective. And that was one of the factors that uh, drove us to ask about lottery gift ticket receipt. And I think that that's been picked up by uh, the McGill Center for um, International, the International uh, Youth Risk Behavior Center there, and they've been promoting it through Canada and the U.S. Keith White at the National Council has used that uh, to help provide teeth, if you will, to some of the initiatives that they have been promoting before they had those data, but now they have evidence to support them. I think Don has used that um, here uh, recently over the, the past month. So trying to think about those questions that we can, um, if we can get data and provide answers that will help sway policymakers is one, I think, important approach to have a significant public health impact. I think getting back to the question about what are some of the things that might um, occur at a, a clinical level, I think that's also very important, but I think it's important for us to think about the different domains in which we can make an impact and try to gather the data that will help uh, guide decision making in those different domains.